welcome everyone to this, the first Macrossan lecture since this time last year, which is uh, many of you who are here present last year would know was the first Macrossan lecture in, in 30 years. And so uh, thank you one and all for joining us for this, the 2024 Macrossan lecture. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Rick Bigwood and I'm the Sir Gerard Brennan Chair in Law and Academic Dean and Head of School of the TC Byrne School of Law at the University of Queensland. It's also my pleasure uh, to be your Master of Ceremonies tonight. Most people don't know me as a talented MC because I'm not. Um, on behalf of all of the speakers here this evening, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. On behalf of the University of Queensland and the UQ Law Alumni Association, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country and I extend the same respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be in attendance this evening. I acknowledge the contemporary Queensland First Nations community who continue to maintain their identity, culture and Indigenous rights. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the distinguished guests who are present here this evening, not least of which of whom uh, is uh, Her Honour, the Honourable Chief Justice Helen Boskell, who has graciously allowed us to use this venue for uh, tonight's lecture. I see the, um, the um, President of the Court of Appeal, Her Honour Justice Deborah Mullins is present as, as well, so thank you for coming. Of course, I acknowledge our guest speaker, the Honourable Geoffrey Davis, a Davies AO, who will uh, uh, of more of whom I'll say more later. Uh, also present are many current and retired judges of the Supreme Court of Queensland, including the Court of Appeal Division of that court and of the Federal Court and the District Court. I make special mention too of the Honourable Justice Hugh Fraser, who was our uh, speaker la at last year's Macrossan uh, lecture. I also uh, acknowledge the attendance of my colleagues from the law school, other members of the academy, donors to the law school and alumni of the University of Queensland. Like everyone here, I'm looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker tonight, the Honourable Geoffrey Davies AO. This lecture event is a co-production between the UQ Law Alumni Association and the University of Queensland. The driving force behind it has been adjunct Professor John McKenna, Casey without, through whose vision and effort the reanimation of the Macrossan lecture series would not have occurred at all. I remain grateful to the strong relationship the UQ Law Alumni Association has with the law school, I'm particularly humbled by their fundraising efforts to support our students who for whatever reason find themselves uh, in need of financial assistance to progress their studies and their life plans. So thank you, John, and, and the broader UQ Law Alumni community for your generosity. Allow me to say a little about the history of the Macrossan Lecture series, which history I only know because of a short paper once provided to me by John McKenna. On the 7th of August 1925, the Macrossan family donated 2,000 pounds to the University of Queensland to fund an annual lecture on, the sub on subjects of public interest. It was the first lectureship of its kind established in Queensland. Pursuant to the terms of the trust, it was, and I quote, the duty of the John Murtagh Macrossan lecturer to lecture in Brisbane on subject, some subject relating to, and then a list follows, the life and work of any person not living at the time of the lecture who has rendered distinguished service in public life to Australia, Australian history, political economy, sociology, science, law, art, or literature. From my perspective, I'm delighted to note that this is an early example of a philanthropic gift to the University of Queensland, the field of law, rather than our uh, law school, uh, which wouldn't have been established, of course, till 1936. Philanthropy is, of course, a tradition that continues, and may I again express my sincere gratitude to the many philanthropic donors uh, joining us here uh, this, this, morning, this evening. Now, to say a little bit of, by way of introduction of our invited speaker, Tonight. The Honourable Geoffrey Davies AO has had a distinguished legal career. He graduated Bachelor of Laws from the University of Queensland in 1959 and practised for 30 years at the bar in Brisbane uh, before taking seat. He took silk in 1976. Uh, he was appointed to the bench in 1991 where he served on the Court of Appeal of Queensland until 2005. He has held various significant positions, including Chairperson of the Litigation Reform Commission, Solicitor General of the State of Queensland, and President of the Queensland Bar Association. 
In 2003, he was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia for his service to the judiciary and legal profession. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming the Honourable Geoffrey Davies, AO, to the lectern. He will speak on the question of whether the civil trial system is past its use-by date. Thank you, Rick. Chief Justice, President of the Court of Appeal, judges of all the courts, distinguished guests all. I'm honoured to be giving this the Macrossan Lecture for 2024, which celebrates the contributions of the Macrossan family to the law in this state. As some of you did, I knew the last of the Macrossan Chief Justices, the Honourable John Macrossan. I was junior to him at the bar on many occasions. I appeared before him when he became a judge and I later sat with him in the Court of Appeal. He was an outstanding lawyer and he had a very quick mind. But his mild and polite manner often concealed from those before him how quick he had been in perceiving the argument they were putting and the weaknesses in that argument, often to the cost of the barristers concerned. I found him a wonderful person to appear with in a court. I found him difficult as a judge because I had to prepare more than I had with some other judges. And he was a joy to sit with in the Court of Appeal because he could do all the work for me. <laughs> I learnt a lot from him, although I never managed to master his politeness or his felicity of expression. Because of the topic of my lecture tonight and uh, uh, what I propose to say, I should add that John Macrossan was a conservative and a traditionalist and that I'm not sure how much he would enjoy about what I'm going to say. In delivering the Gerard Brennan Lecture in 2011, the Honourable John Doyle, AC Chief Justice of South Australia, a person not given to exaggeration, said this, I believe that during the time of the next generation of legal practitioners, those now being admitted to practice, civil litigation as we know it in the higher courts will come to an end. And he subtitled his lecture, The Demise of Civil Litigation. There's no doubt, in my opinion, that the cost of a trial of an action in the Supreme Court, even for a successful party, is in most cases beyond the means of the average citizen, or even of a small company. For a losing party of average means, that is almost certainly the case. And there's nearly always a risk for either party of doing worse by judgment than that party expects. That's been the position now for a considerable time. And that is why over 95% of actions commenced in the Supreme Court are resolved before judgment. The cost of going to trial and judgment is for many parties the effective deterrent to proceeding to an action, especially in an action where the amount or value is less than, say, a million dollars. In those cases, costs may be a substantial proportion of the amount or value in dispute. So the system of lit civil litigation by trial and judgment is not working for most potential litigants. And that is no doubt why the Chief Justice Doyle said what he did. There are two aspects of costs which, in my opinion, are of concern. The first is that of those cases which are resolved before judgment, a massive proportion are resolved only at or close to trial after all pretrial costs have been incurred. And that is, unfortunately, at a cost 
which most litigants can't afford. And, as it turns out, a cost which was in, last, in large part unnecessarily incurred. And the second is that of those cases which are resolved before judgment, it is likely that a substantial portion are resolved only or principally because the litigants, or one of them, can't afford to proceed. There are, I think, many cases resolved by agreement in which one or both parties to the dispute would reasonably have preferred to have their dispute resolved by an independent arbiter at a reasonable cost than by agreement. So first in this lecture I propose to say why I think that our system and the way in which those within it operate impede early resolution of a dispute. Secondly, I'll explain what I think should be done to change this. There are two aspects of this. The first is to show how I think that those cases which are resolved by agreement may be resolved before the majority of pretrial costs have been incurred. And the second is, is to explain why I think that there are some cases which are incapable of resolution by agreement, at least initially, but amenable to early neutral evaluation and how that may be achieved. Thirdly, I want to say why I think that the present system with respect to experts is misconceived and how radical change to that system will, in my opinion, ensure earlier, cheaper and fairer resolution of questions requiring expertise and consequently, in many cases, early resolution of an action. And finally, I want to say something about whether, and if so, how an alternative, cheaper system of deciding disputes can be devised. For if it can't, our system of trial and judgment will remain effectively accessible only to persons or entities to whom the cost is not an effective deterrent. then in that case it would be past its use-by date. So first of all, why the adversarial system and the way with those within it operate impede early resolution of a dispute. An analysis of actions commenced in the Supreme Court over the past decade yields two relevant percentages. The first is, and I mentioned this earlier, that of actions commenced, more than 95% are resolved without a judgment. And the second is that while approximately one half of defendant actions are listed for trial, the, of those which are so listed, less than 10% go on to trial and judgment. That is, more than 90% of those are resolved by settlement or abandonment only after most or possibly even all pretrial costs have been incurred. And that percentage, the 90%, appears to be increasing over the last few years. There are three impediments to early resolution of disputes which I think can be eliminated or at least mitigated. The first is the way in which the system requires all actions to proceed under the existing rules of court as if they are to go to trial and judgment notwithstanding that the reality is that the vast majority end before then. Under the civil procedure rules, ADR is relatively new. It came into force only in 1999. And in those rules, it appears to, to arise only after virtually all of the trial preparation has taken place. In other words, the system itself still assumes a likely trial and judgment with ADR only as a last minute exception. The second and third impediments are of greater concern. The second is the tendency of lawyers, notwithstanding that they could seek ADR early in the proceedings, to take every step in those proceedings almost up to trial before attempting to do so. An explanation for this tendency by some lawyers is that unless they proceed up to at least disclosure, 
before seeking resolution by agreement, they may not uncover all of their opponent's relevant documents. And if they proceed to settle an action before then, they leave their client unprotected and themselves open to action by the client. If a later contention or discovered document might have changed the client's decision to settle. The reality is that our system is one of party autonomy, or more accurately, the autonomy of the party's lawyers, and that lawyers tend to do too much before attempting settlement. Party autonomy is a leftover from the time when judges of fact were juries. Under such a system, it never occurred to lawyers or to judges that control of the litigation process up to the time of trial its substantive issues, its form and its speed should be other than entirely in the hands of the party's lawyers. But it persists notwithstanding the change to judge-only trials due to the reluctance of lawyers to forego control of the pace and especially the shape of litigation and the reluctance of judges to seize it. As Chief Justice Doyle pointed out, the judge does not determine the issues that will be contested between the parties. The judge not, does not determine how the parties will present their respective case or defence. The judge has no significant control over the quantity or quality of evidence presented on either side, nor over the relationship between the significance of the matter at issue and the efforts or resources deployed by the parties. They can commit more or less resources than the issue warrants, Often it is more. There are incentives to a litigation lawyer under our existing system to do too much rather than too little. In theory, the more work that is done in preparation of a case, the better are the client's prospects of success. The better is the lawyer protected against later being sued by the client and the more that the lawyer earns. And there are no disincentives. Moreover, in most cases, it is difficult to judge how much is too much. Although there have been some modifying changes, it remains fundamentally correct that the parties, or more accurately their lawyers, remain substantially in control of the pace and shape of litigation. And if we are to have a system which works for the majority, that must change in each of these respects. There must be greater judicial control or rule control, especially in the pretrial process, than is presently the case. And the third impediment to early resolution of a dispute is the likely failure of lawyers before litigation commences and thereafter if circumstances change or the situation becomes clearer to advise their clients realistically both of the likely result of litigation and of its likely cost. What parties to a dispute want, or more accurately, what they need when they first approach a litigation lawyer and continuously thereafter may be expressed in three questions. One, what is the likely result if the dispute goes to judgment? Two, what will it cost me to get to that result? And three, can I get to that result or a result approximating it more cheaply? Without answers to each of these questions, a party has no real prospect of weighing the relative advantages and disadvantages of, on the one hand, reaching an agreed early solution and, of the other, uh, and on the other, proceedings judgment or indeed of not proceeding at all. At present, it seems to me, they are unlikely in most cases to get realistic answers to any of those questions, either when they first consult their lawyer or at any subsequent time before the imminence of trial. Uh, as to the first of these, advice about the likely result is a common law duty. Unfortunately, there's no statutory requirement uh, of a statement of that duty, notwithstanding the existence of a statute stating lawyers' other duties. 
in my opinion, there should be such a provision and one stating that the lawyer could be deprived of her costs for giving and failing to correct unrealistic advice. Absent such a disincentive, any such advice is quite likely to be unreliable and optimistic, at least until a trial is imminent. As to the second and third questions, that's requiring a realistic estimate of the cost of proceeding to trial and judgment, there is a statutory obligation upon a lawyer on receiving instructions to give her client an estimate of the total legal costs, if reasonably practical, and if not reasonably practical, a range of estimates. These provisions, in my opinion, are an unsatisfactory statement of the continuing duty of a litigation lawyer to advise her client of the likely costs of an action proceeding to trial and judgment and of the consequences of failure to perform that duty. I want to turn now to how resolution by agreement can, in my opinion, be achieved earlier. But first I'd like to warn against introducing procedures aimed at resolving a dispute which may in fact increase costs. Here is an example. Following the Wolf Report in England, pre-action protocols were introduced by a practice direction under the civil procedure rules. The aim being to encourage parties to settle their dispute without the need to issue proceedings. These require parties to exchange correspondence and information sufficient to understand each other's positions. Whilst this is a laudable aim, it has tended to front load costs because it has been noted the requirements generate time consuming and costly exchanges. These requirements, or more accurately, the way in which they've been implemented by lawyers, involve too much cost to be incurred too soon in a system in which statistically the vast majority of the cases will be resolved before judgment. So it's not something I would recommend here. I turn now to some measures which I think will have a positive effect. The plaintiff's lawyer should be obliged shortly after filing and service of the originating proceeding to provide to her client costs estimate and an opinion of the likely result if the action goes to trial and judgment. At the same time, the lawyers of any person so served who propose to defend should be obliged to provide the same to their clients. Accordingly, I suggest that within a short, within a short time, say 14 days, after the filing and service of the originating process, each lawyer's party's lawyer should be obliged to provide her client with a statement containing one, details of legal costs payable by the party to, to the party's lawyer up to that date, and two, an estimate of the party's likely legal costs if the claim proceeds to trial and is determined by a judge, and that a copy of that statement be provided to the court. At the same time, each party's lawyer should be obliged to provide her client with a statement estimating the likely result of the action if it proceeds to trial and judgment, and provide the court with a statement that she has done that. And the lawyer should be obliged to file a sealed copy of that advice to be opened only on a question of costs. These obligations should be enforceable and enforced. The lawyer should have her costs otherwise recoverable from her client reduced if she fails to comply with these provisions. An unrealistic estimate of costs or of the likely result of the action should, in the absence of compelling reason to the contrary, be sufficient evidence of this failure. There should be provisions in the rules which provide for that enforcement. At the same time, I think the parties should be obliged to exchange a short number of documents, say 10 of the principal documents on which they rely. Once these obligations have been complied with or the time for their performance has expired, mediation should automatically occur. By that I mean that mediation should occur 
without the necessity of a court order. There would, of course, need to be provisions for how that takes place. Under the present regime, I'm told that some parties, or perhaps more accurately, their lawyers, tend to treat early mediation not so much as an attempt to resolve the action by agreement, but more as a means of testing the strengths and weaknesses of the opponent's case. But if the parties are by this stage armed with more realistic answers to the questions which I have posed, and knowledge of the opponent's principal contentions and documents, there should be greater interest in the possibility of resolution by agreement. This may be especially so in cases which it could then be seen were likely to assume, uh, costs were likely to assume a substantial part of the amount or value in issue. So far I've discussed automatic procedures, that is, those which occur without the intervention of a judge. But if the action has not been resolved by these procedures, then I think a court should intervene, although it could do so by informal means, but it should have power to make orders for various further steps, further mediation, neutral evaluation, appointment of an expert, which I'll come to later, uh, and deciding separately uh, and in advance of trial any question of fact or law, and most importantly, how the action should be tried. Now, I appreciate that some of these are dealt with by practice directions. However, I want to say a little more about some of these which may result in earlier resolution. First of all, resolution by neutral evaluation. There are some cases which will not initially be capable of resolution by agreement, but which would be amenable to early neutral evaluation. One example is where a party or that party's lawyer has an unrealistic view of the likely result upon judgment. Another is where, because of a substantial financial imbalance between the parties, the negotiating power of the poorer party may be impaired by her realisation that litigation against her richer opponent may lead to her own financial ruin, and where that imbalance is impeding a fair resolution by agreement. I don't mean to imply that case appraisal should be limited to those cases. It's useful in many cases in which there appears to be a reluctance to agree. That is why I think it should be an important part of the procedures used to resolve actions. It has been rarely used. I am told that the principal reason for this is that lawyers have tended to prepare for a case appraisal as if it were a trial, and so, in effect, incurred the costs of a trial. That, of course, was never its intention. It was intended to be a summary procedure in which costs were limited. It is another example of lawyers tending to do too much, more than is warranted by the evident intent of the provisions and therefore to cost more than the procedure intended. If it is to be used, and I think it should, there should be an order accompanying it for costs, that is, limiting costs of the parties in that procedure. I want to turn now to resolving questions involving expertise more rationally, more fairly and more cheaply than they are now. Sometimes the resolution of a question involving expertise will lead to resolution of the case or a shortening of the trial. It's therefore beneficial in all cases to resolve that question promptly. But under our present system, that requires a trial of that question. That is because our system, in my opinion, mis misunderstands the true role of an expert in court proceedings. If I were to start afresh, to des design a means of deciding a question involving expertise, I would, having no expertise myself, ask an expert to decide it. Or if it appeared that there might reasonably be different views among experts on the questions, 
I would appoint a panel of those experts holding different views and attempt to have them resolve their differences. And to the extent that they did not, I'd accept the majority opinion. But again, having no expertise, I would not attempt to decide the question myself. That is the way in which such questions are resolved every day in business, in industry and in the professions. If someone were to suggest to me that such a question could best be resolved by my hearing two or more experts appointed by opposing parties, have each of them cross-examined by a person who had no expertise, and by then attempting to decide the question myself, I would think that suggestion irrational. And so would those who seek to have those questions resolved every day in business, in industry and in the professions. Yet that is the system which, with some minor modifications, we have now. Judges should not attempt to decide questions involving expertise. Such questions are, by definition and in reality, beyond the competence of judges to decide. To be fair to our distant forebears, there may well have been a time when questions involving expertise, which came before a court, were few and simple, and consequently questions which, with little help, a judge or more likely a jury could decide. And it may well be that jury trials could not have been conducted efficiently in any other way. But if that were so, it has long ceased to be the case. Certainly, ever since I've been involved in the law, there have been many actions in which a question involving expertise arises, which is beyond the understanding of a judge, let alone within her competence to decide. Nor should a question involving expertise be turned into an adversarial contest especially one in which the arguments on each side are made or controlled by non-experts. To want to do this requires an adversarial mindset. The irrationality of the present system is highlighted, in my opinion, by the rules relating to referees. Under those rules, a judge may appoint a referee to decide any question of fact or law, questions which the judge herself is eminently qualified to decide. But a judge may not appoint an expert to decide a question involving expertise, a question which is by definition beyond the competence of a judge to decide. It must be decided by a judge or jury after an adversarial contest. Of course, a judge may appoint an expert under the present system, but that is a witness only in that adversarial contest. The system, therefore, in my opinion, misunderstands the real role of an expert. She should not be a witness in proceedings in the way in which witnesses of fact are. She is, in reality, a decision maker in the way in which a judge is, or perhaps a better analogy, as a referee is. The expert's role is to decide a question which is, by definition, beyond the expertise of the judge to decide. That is, in my opinion, the fallacy of the existing rules. Some may say that that is, in effect, what occurs now, that the expert or panel, in effect, decides the question. But if that is so, we should face reality. We should not pretend that this is an adversarial contest which is decided by a judge. An expert or panel should, in most cases, be appointed by the judge to decide a question involving expertise and once appointed she or they should proceed to decide that question. No doubt the expert should be able to confer with the judge to ensure clarification of the question which she has to decide and the facts on which to decide it, but she should have no more contact with the parties or their lawyers than does the judge or a referee. Nor should the question involving expertise be turned into an adversarial contest. The expert should not be cross-examined by the parties if there is a doubt as to the factual basis upon 
which the question is to be decided, or the question itself, the judge should have the power to seek the party's submissions on this. So it seems to me that the rules with respect to experts should be radically changed. The existing rule should remain for exceptional cases only, and otherwise there should be rules along the lines I have suggested. Such a system would have a number of advantages over the existing system. In the first place, it would recognise the reality that an expert or panel of experts <coughs> is in effect the decision maker on the question involving expertise. Secondly, by ensuring that the judge is appointing a decision maker, it would remove the risk which presently exists that the opinion of an adversarially appointed expert, which may be accepted because she is more articulate or more persuasive than the opposing expert, will be biased in favour of the party who appoints her. Whose bread I eat, his song I sing. It is mere wishful thinking that statements in court rules purporting to impose expert duties on expert witnesses will change that. Thirdly, it enables an effective decision on that question early in the litigation process. And fourthly, it eliminates the costs incurred in having opposing experts proofed by non-experts and cross-examined by non-experts. Unfortunately, these rules are unlikely to be used by lawyers unless compelled to do so they will be unwilling to surrender their own appointed experts. So these provisions should state, in my opinion, that they will apply to the exclusion of Chapter 11, Part 5, other than in exceptional circumstances, and the fact that a party has already appointed an expert is not an exceptional circumstance. I wanted to say something also about deciding questions of fact or law in advance of trial, but I don't think I have the time to do that here, uh, but uh, you can read it in my, in my written paper. I also say, say, say a little about exchange of offers of settlement, which I won't discuss with you now. I want to turn now to deciding on the manner of trial. <coughs> if the purpose, or one of the principal purposes, of our civil justice system is to provide resolution of disputes by adjudication by a judge, then it does not fulfil that purpose if it provides access to such adjudication only to a small proportion of those who would want it. The very rich, or the funded, or those few other potential plaintiffs whose likelihood of success is all but guaranteed. And I think that that is the case. There are, it seems to me, two related reasons for this. The first is that over many decades, the classes of litigants have increased substantially. Before, say, the 1950s, most litigants were either men of property, no women, or corporations. Then in the decades following Donahue and Stevenson in 1932, the law of negligence expanded exponentially. Added to that, social changes and legislative initiatives, especially in social welfare and economic regulation, which commenced in the 1950s and are still continuing, have made all of us potential litigants. And the second, partly for these reasons, is that relations between us, especially business relations and consequently litigation, has become more complex and therefore more expensive. The massively high proportion of cases which are resolved mostly by agreement before judgment may therefore be seen in two lights. On the one hand, it is to be applauded that so many litigants have chosen to resolve their disputes by agreement. On the other, if it is the case as I think it is, 
it is to be regretted that so many litigants have been deprived of having their disputes resolved by a judge solely or principally because they cannot afford to go to trial. If it is true, as at present I think it is, that many litigants settle their actions solely or principally because they cannot afford to go to trial, there needs to be a more summary system of adjudication which is within the means of ordinary litigants and small companies. The present system may well change with the introduction of artificial intelligence into our system. There is little doubt that AI could and should reduce the work done by lawyers in basic routine tasks like disclosure. It should also enable more accurate prediction of costs and in consequence increase early resolution by agreement. It may enable more accurate prediction of the likely outcome of cases with the same result. And it may enable accurate prediction of those cases or those kinds of cases which are more likely to be resolved by agreement. But most importantly of all, it should assist in designing a cheaper and fairer system of deciding disputed questions of fact, possibly also of law. So the application of artificial intelligence to our system is likely ultimately to substantially change it. But whether, how and when that is likely to occur is at present unpredictable. And I don't think the changes which, which I have proposed uh, should be postponed until then. I won't attempt to design at the kind of trial system which I have in mind, but in the absence of artificial intelligence, it would be along the lines of the present rules with respect to case appraisal, but with a binding judgment. However, I do think that AI could be used to design a cheaper and more efficient way of deciding disputed questions of fact. I'd like now to make a few concluding remarks. I've said in this lecture more than once that our present system of trial and judgment is beyond the financial capacity of the ordinary litigant or small company, that only large corporations, government entities, funded parties and those whose success at trial is all but guarantee can afford to litigate in the Supreme Court. If that is so, then our trial system is working only for a small percentage of potential litigants. In this lecture, I've suggested two possible solutions. The first is one which, within the existing trial system, will better ensure that all of those disputes which can reasonably be resolved by agreement are resolved earlier and more cheaply than they now are. The second is more radical because it involves an alternative, cheaper trial system for litigants who should be able to have their disputes resolved by an independent arbiter but can't afford to litigate under the present system. And these may well be the majority of litigants in defended cases. Do I think that these proposals are likely to be adopted in the foreseeable future? No, I don't. Hardly anyone likes changing the way they do things, especially if they've been doing them for a long time. And even less so if, as in this case, the way they have been doing it follows practices and traditions of highly respected forebears. The law is a conservative profession, as in many ways it should be. This makes it difficult for us to accept that a system which was once the subject of pride and admiration has by a substantial increase in the classes of litigants it serves and a substantial increase in the complexity of our relations with one another ceased to operate successfully. That a system which may have operated effectively in say the 1950s has become in its operation too labour intensive and too expensive for most of the classes of litigants it now serves. 
But consider this. Under a system substantially controlled by the party's lawyers, though 50% of defendant actions go to trial, only 10% of those go on to hearing and judgment. That is, 90% of actions listed for trial are either settled or abandoned. In addition to that, you've got an overall dropout rate of 95%. So together, 95% overall dropout rate and a late dropout rate of 90% of actions listed to a trial. Doesn't that show that the trial system is not working? How many of those dropouts would have been better satisfied and reasonably so by a cheaper trial system? So it seems to me that radical change to our system is not just desirable but essential. And if that includes a radically different system of deciding disputed questions of fact and law, it may fulfil the prediction, some may have said gloomy prediction, by Chief Justice Doyle. Thank you for listening to me. So uh, thank you, Your Honour, uh, for continuing to sh share your knowledge and expertise uh, with the Queensland legal community and for giving a lecture that so uh, faithfully honours the original intention of the trustee that established uh, this series. Um, needless to say, I'm, I'm delighted uh, at, this, at the uh, uh, size of the turnout uh, at, at this evening's lecture, and I'm particularly grateful to scholarship donors uh, who have come along. I'd now like to invite to the lecture in one of our students and a recent recipient of a UQLA Endowment Fund scholarship, Ms Jamie Moore, to deliver the vote of thanks to our speaker. Thank you again, Honourable Geoffrey Davies, AO, for continuing to share your extensive knowledge and expertise with the Queensland law community. We are truly delighted to have such a strong turnout for this relaunch of the Macrossan Lecture Series tonight. I am particularly grateful to the many scholarship donors here this evening. My name is Jamie Moore, and as one of the scholarship recipients myself, I know firsthand the extraordinary impact this assistance has for law students in need. Just over a year ago, I relocated from Townsville to Brisbane to study at UQ and I am currently in my second year of a double degree in law and arts. My family has consistently struggled financially, and I would not have been able to afford the ongoing accommodation costs of living in Brisbane to attend this wonderful university if it weren't for the invaluable support I received from the UQ Law School and the UQ Law Alumni Association. As I embarked on this exciting new stage in my life, it was an immense relief for both myself and my family to have these financial pressures eased. Due to the scholarships I was awarded, I have also been able to take the opportunity to volunteer with the UQ Pro Bono Centre and participate in projects which have continued to fuel my passion for human rights, community service and working to achieve justice for all people. I have absolutely loved my law degree so far and I continue to be inspired by the dedication and enthusiasm of all my professors, lecturers and tutors, as well as the eagerness to learn that is shared among my peers. I am eternally grateful for all the opportunities, resources and support the UQ Law School and the UQ Law Alumni Association have given me. It is thanks to the generosity of all the incredible scholarship donors of the university, which allow students like myself to have access to a legal education at such a renowned institution. Receiving scholarships from the UQ Law School has had such a positive impact on my life and I'm sure the lives of many students and has made my experience at UQ so far all the more meaningful and fulfilling. Thank you again, Honourable Geoffrey Davies AO, for sharing your insights with us tonight. Scholarship donors, and all those who have attended the 2024 Macrossan Lecture this evening. 
And of course, this annual event is only possible because of the UQ Law Alumni Association. So my sincere thanks goes to the society for all that they continue to do for both the legal community and the students of UQ. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I'd like to invite his honour back on stage to uh, present him with a, a, a gift, a token of our appreciation. What about coming over to here? Yeah, I'm <laughs> kind of lazy. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I should thank John McKenna. That's a donation from his private cellar. The, the frightening alternative is that it would have come from my cellar, but I'm not sure how Jonas stood up with um, on uh, Yellowtail. But um, <laughs> I'm sure it's very good. Well, well look, that, that concludes the, uh, this year's uh, Macrossan lecture. Uh, as his honour indicated, um, a transcript of, of the lecture will eventually be made available in a truncated version in the hearsay publication and the full version in the University of Queensland Law Journal in due course. And so it just remains for me again to thank everyone for joining us here at this year's uh, lecture. I'd uh, like everyone once again to show their appreciation to the Honourable Geoffrey Davies. <laughs>